Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, welcome to the Women Talk Tech Mini Institute. Um, we'll just introduce ourselves really quick. I'm Kristen Abel. I'm the um, Director of Residential Life at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I also blog uh, personally, um, and then I was the co-founder of the Student Affairs Women Talk Tech blog. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later, and I'll let my co-presenters introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Cindy Kane. I'm the Director of Student Involvement and Leadership at Bridgewater State University here in Massachusetts. Um, various tech-related activities for me have to do with um, contrib contributions to the Essay Collaborative um, for me, which includes writing blog posts for that blog site, uh, the essaybloggers.org, and also facilitating uh, Twitter chats regularly through the Essay Chat. Um, also on my campus, some tech-related initiatives as well for the Student Affairs Division. Hi, and I'm Jennifer Keegan. Um, I'm Associate Director for Campus Activities at Binghamton, New York, in upstate New York. Um, and I also am the co-host of the Break Drink podcast, which is the College Union and Activities Discussion podcast with Mike Coleman. Um, we do every two weeks. We actually have one on Monday. And um, also, I'm one of the bloggers on Women Talk Tech. Yay. Um, so we have a kind of brief outline of our um, session today. Oh yes, and we all also have additional titles. Um, I'm blog and techno goddess. Cindy is the tweeter extraordinaire and Jennifer's blog and web mistress. So very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to look at kind of the state of the current state of affairs for women in technology. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, your experiences. And then we'll also look at what are the um, what do we need to do moving forward to change the current state of affairs? So Cindy, if you want to hit that. Um, so I just pulled a couple of graphics that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, this is a recent uh, fanboy um, from a fanboy article about Apple uh, iPhone 5. Um, and what I think is interesting, they, oh, you know, well, well we definitely include fangirl. Um, but uh, they also talk about Apple fanboy here, and this is their portrait of a fangirl. Um, stunning, isn't she? So I thought that was just kind of an interesting visual portrayal, and then you want to hit my other. Um, and then this is the evolution of the geek, which I absolutely love, really, and it's a little bit small. But these are all the different kind of, of geeks, pop culture geek. Um, I think there's a computer geek in here. It's kind of hard to read these, but there are no female geeks apparently. So um, I just thought that was kind of interesting to share. So those are a couple of visual um, portrayals. And then um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, uh, National Center for Women in Technology um, has some spectacular information out there. If you ever get a chance to uh, visit, they have um, a report that they did in 2008 about the state of um, women in technology. And some of the information that I found there was really, really interesting. Um, for example, women earn 57% of bachelor's degrees, but only 18% of computer and information uh, science bachelor's degrees. That's a huge disparity there. Um, this is our SAT statistics, which I thought was fantastic, or fantastically interesting. So students indicating competing information sciences as intended major on SAT. The green is women. They're coming into college with a very low interest. Um, so although a lot of us work at that, that college level, there are things that we can be doing at the high school, at the grade school level too, to keep these young women interested in technology. Um, the other piece is looking at our, the professional industry. Um, in 2008, this women held 57% of all professional occupations in the United States, but only 25% of IT related jobs. And the big thing there is the quit rate for women is huge in IT. Um, so you can see in, in technology specifically, 56% of women who quit their jobs in technology. Um, that's, that's huge. Um, and so what we're seeing is they're, even when they're going into the field of technology, they're not staying. And some of the factors that they mentioned for not staying were corporate culture or you know, company culture. Um, in general, the positions that women felt like they were being uh, pigeonholed into were the back uh, behind stage positions, whereas the creators and producers were men. Um, and that's a big part of this as well. 
Um, and so there's a lot of, of those factors that are going into that quit rate, but it's that's gigantic for women that even when they get into the field, they're not staying and we're not providing them enough support to stay. Go ahead. Okay, and the other thing that I wanted to highlight was the diversity in our, um, for women in technology. And it's not great. So 18% of positions, um, technology related positions held by women are held by white women. 18% of that 25%, I should say. So 18%, 25% of positions are held, eight, I don't know if that makes sense. But anyways, and then 4% Asian women, 2% African American women, and 1.5% Hispanic women. So even the women that were getting there, we're still not reaching out to all women when we are finally getting some women into technology related positions. Um, again, the salary gap was another big uh, player in the um, women who are leaving the industry. You can see here, these are some of the larger salary gaps. Web developer and programmer, there's a 14% salary gap for women versus men. That's crazy to me. I mean, that's because I would love to do web developing, you know, and it's like I look at that and I'm like, how can I even compete for that? Um, developer applications, software engineer. Then you get down to things like technical writer, technical support, and there's a much smaller gap there. Again, that's reflecting some of that producer, creator roles versus the support roles. So some very interesting statistics there. And I, I pulled a lot of stuff, like I said, from this report because it was just absolutely fascinating. Um, one thing that uh, I did want to share that about that quit rate again, it's double, double the rate for men. Uh, double the, the women's rate of quit rate is double that of men's quit rate. So that is, I mean, it seems significant by itself. It's, it's extremely significant with that. Okay, sorry, I just wanna, let's, you wanna flip to the next slide? Is this the video? We got nothing on that slide? <laughs> Little technical glitch. We had a few videos that we want to show you, just kind of of what the public perception or the pop culture uh, representation of um, women in technology is. And Jennifer was going to talk about those if we can get them to play. <laughs> Please hold. Well, while they're trying to find it, um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was. There's a whole bunch of information, uh, a whole website you can't see anymore. And it was from Dell Computers, and it was called Della. Anybody heard about this? I didn't, didn't even know it existed. You can't find it, it's gone. So as I was helping to research for this session, um, you know, you start finding all kinds of information. You start finding old advertisements for women in tech. I found something for a Kodak lady back in the 30s, and I just started finding all this wealth of information once you start looking for it. So as we were talking about commercials, this, that, and the other, um, I started finding, oh, did you hear about this website that Dell had for women? It's called Della. And I was like, no. And you can't, like I said, you can't find it. But I was able to find some screen captures and things. Um, and some of the things that they, you know, they sold the, you know, the computers that are, you know, that have colors and accessories and this, that, and the other. But a lot of the, the wording for the site was apparently just atrocious. Um, it was something like, you know, um, these computers, you know, they can do even more than just email. <laughs> like all the, all the women would be doing was just checking email with computers. And so there was a big uproar about it. I'm like, well, I don't even see it. I don't even know about it. Um, so it's gone now and you can't even find it. But I just thought that was interesting to mention that there was a company who, who thought that, that they had a handle on what women wanted and, and thought they were marketing it correctly. And then we would say, no, not so much. Um, we like to do lots of stuff with, with our computers besides just check for email. Um, and, and these videos are all of different commercials that show different ways of portraying women uh, in tech that we thought were nice. Oh, we may or may not be able to get them working. No, this is what you get for using Google Docs, right? <laughs> even if we can show just that oh, one, cool. even if we had to just pull up that one Apple. Oh, you can sign in. It kicked you off your network. 
Yeah. Was it was it Della D L L A? D E L yeah D E L L A. I was looking the way back. Yep. Yep. One of the things um, while we're trying to get those to to go really quick, I don't know, maybe it'll work this time. Still not there. Or if you just open it from YouTube or um, Google. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Do you have to refresh the presentation? So we didn't know how many people would have the room, so I wanted to just kind of show these in succession and then see what themes you guys and what you kind of noticed after watching a few of these. Here we go. All righty. Hopefully we'll make you sick watching them. different things with probably some different themes but first of all as, as a obviously a PC lady in the room I don't have a hairy chest like an advertisement but that's okay um, what, what kind of things like like as you take all three into consideration what kind of you know things did you see that maybe I don't know got you thinking Anything? so the representation of, of women contrasts with the representation of men is, is pretty obvious and pretty overt. You know, it's it's the guys or the you know the, the, the boys with the technology either being represented as you know the Mac commercial. It's the I'm a Mac on PC. It's two guys or the you know the father and son um, or the guy in the coffee shop. You know, and then the representations of women. Uh, there are hardly any women in the videos, and then when they all, when women are represented in the videos, they're as Objectification, right? It's the purpose of you know Giselle is a model and she's the the you know the Mac guys thing. And then um, to make fun of the PC, you've got a guy with a wig on dressed up like a lady, um, which is almost making fun of women in the, in the commercial. So it's very obvious, and it's not. I mean, this is just a small snapshot, but mm -hmm. this is pretty much how it is in the media, magazines, print, video, right. you name. And and we were saying that women are always on the periphery. They're never like the main focus. They're always just, especially the first one, there's that, you know, there's a girl 
every time. When I saw it at first, I was like, oh, they're such dorks. They don't even notice the girls in their life, you know, around them. But then when Chris and I were talking about it, she's like, well, the women are always in the periphery. And I was like, right. And I thought that, that was an interesting way of looking at it. I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to say about that one. Yeah, I just think it's interesting if you watch the intel. The very first time I saw it, the woman just kept walking in the background. I'm like, how bizarre. I mean, it's like they really just put out there that, that – the women are supposed to be in the background, and the men are the ones you want to focus on. So, yeah, and then of course, either way, we were we were also saying either representation. If you're the Mac or if you're the PC, even the even the Mac representation is just like, oh, I'm just I'm just here, I'm just pretty, I'm just standing here. So even that was a bunch of fluff. Even if you know you were the Mac lady, so. Um, you know, there, there's so much. Um, if you start, if you start looking, and, and beyond even tech, if you start looking at different, there, there's this great clip um, about kids' toys, and and you know, we were talking about things that can be done when kids are in school. And I have I have a little daughter who's almost three, so my husband says I want her to be an engineer one day. Well, when putting this together, I was really interested in this topic too, and how can we, you know, with younger kids as well, and. You have the toys for boys and then the little toys for girls and you know how can we start that with, with young with young kids as well and so um, pay attention when you when you, you know when you see these things and there's a lot of talk out there in the media about who, who are making these things well, are the men making these commercials and women who have you know the, the chance to put things out there differently you know we need to go sisterhood and <laughs> get more get, get better commercials out there but yeah just so you guys are aware that this is the kind of stuff that's out there Oh, is it going right to me now for this? Yeah. Oops. All right. We did talk about a lot of negative representation women, so we wanted to at least highlight the fact that there are some women who are very successful in technology. And so um, we found from a, um, oh, a camera. It's Forbes. Um, most Forbes. influential women in tech. So we have three examples for you of some women um, from, like, um, picked from the last couple of years. So the first one is this year, okay? So um, Carol, I don't know, it's probably Carol Layton. Layton. Um, she is, I'm um, sorry, I was not prepared to be the next person. Um, she, I'm so sorry. She founded her own technology consultancy, Criterion Research, in 1985. And she has a background in education, a sector where, you know, female solidarity rules. She set about to create a support network. And she created Women in Technology International in 1989, which was essentially an email network to help coordinate events for women in technology. But then, of course, over the years, it's gotten much, much bigger. Um, and <laughs> they put it here. Um, there was no meetup.com. There wasn't, you know, Facebook. So she was one of the first people bringing women together um, through the Internet to, to have a common bond to talk about you know, similar issues. The next one from 2010, most influential women in tech. Um, there's Meredith Artley, who's the managing editor at CNN.com. And in uh, 2009, um, Eliza, Jory, and Lisa, um, who are from Blogger. I don't know how many people are familiar with Blogger. Um, it's a whole network of blogs all put together in, in one place um, that anybody can really register. And they do a lot. It's not just the blogs. It's actually, like um, Jennifer said, it's actually a network. And um, they do a lot to help fund women blogging. So they pull together a bunch of adver advertisers, and you can work through their advertising network as well, and which I do. Um, and they also um, try to work with you to promote your blog. Um, so it's a fantastic, it really is huge for a lot of those women who were just kind of breaking into blogging and not really sure how to get the word out there. So and there's all kinds of topics. So if you go, it's fun just to go through. Absolutely. One of the things that we felt like it was important to define was what is it, what does it mean to be a woman in technology? Um, technology um, is a huge, huge field. And so I thought we'd talk a little bit, one, about each of our, what it means for us to be a woman in technology, um, but also if you have ideas of what it means for you to be a woman in technology or to know a woman in technology. Um, you know, share those with us. And so for me, um, I work with a lot of different tools. I work a lot online. That's my primary interest area. That does not mean that I know how to work a projector necessarily, <laughs> although I have learned how to do that with various conferences. Um, but it, that is not my primary job responsibility. Um, I am, like I said, the director of residence life. And so how does that relate to being 
a woman in technology? Well, the fact that I do support our division's technology efforts means that I am a woman in technology. So I do think that that's important. I don't know, Jennifer and Cindy, if you want to talk about I was just going to say real quick, I almost didn't get to come to this conference, which was kind of funny because um, the person who works under me, the program coordinator in, in activities, um, he has an aptitude for fixing computers, this, that, and the other, and we were talking about, we'll get more into the, you know these things, but um, the dean of students knows him to be somebody who is techie and, and knows about computers. So when I requested for both of us to come to this conference, she said, well, I'd really prefer if only one of you go, so maybe Jeremy should go since he kind of fixes all of our computers. And I said, well, actually, I'm presenting in Boston um, about a Tech 101, and I'm doing those podcasts I told you about every two weeks, and I'm also, you know, on that blog, that Women Talk Tech blog, so I really thought that a lot of that would, you know, enhance what I do here and kind of continue that. And she was like, oh, right. <laughs> And so I had to really get out there and say, like, no, actually, he might know how to fix a computer, but I'm taking what I know and I'm applying it to this position and I'm out there representing the university, these other things. So, no, I don't know how to fix a computer, but there's other things that I do know that are of value that are tech. So that's my little. I would say my piece is that I'm not sure I call myself a woman in technology necessarily. Um, you know, I think I'm a woman in student affairs. I'm a woman in student leadership development is my focus, um, and I really consider technology a pathway to how I can accomplish my goals of helping students learn and helping develop community on campus. Uh, I would say two years ago, I would have never said um, anything to do with technology uh, until we started developing projects on the departmental level and we started understanding how technology can shape our work. And then now, two years later, I find myself as a woman in technology uh, with a position that doesn't necessarily dictate that. Um, so I think my experience has been um, learning how to assert my expertise um, in groups uh, without positional leadership roles uh, for these areas um, has been really interesting. Uh, I also work on a campus that has a woman who's our uh, primary web, um, web mistress and um, learning from her and learning about uh, how she's been able to be successful in technology fields has been a really big part of my experience. Uh, but all of you, I'm sure, have had experiences in uh, your range of level of commitment to technology or your level of investment in technology as a field. Um, I think we're a small enough group that maybe, you know, you have things that you'd like to add about being a woman in technology and your experiences. <laughs> or knowing a woman in technology. Well, I, I can speak to that. I mean, yeah. thanks, thanks, Jeff, for... <laughs> That's the <segue. laughs> That's Jeff Jackson. Um, I, my biggest tech role models have been women. I mean, my mom is the one who got the Commodore 64 when I was a kid, who showed me how to use it, who helped me when I had issues with the, the, you know, the dot matrix printer, who, she's the one who programmed all the machines at the grocery store in town in our little small town in Iowa. I mean, she's fearless when it comes to electronics. And my grandmother, before she passed away, you know, when she was in her 80s, she was checking email and using dial-up in rural Iowa and you know, the people that inspire me to, to get into technology were you know, the women in my lives who were older than me, you know, my, my mentors, or my mom, my grandmother. And, and so for me, it's always been really strong women in my life who have influenced me to get into technology. Uh, so I mean, my dad still prints out every email. And so I mean, it's not, it's, it's completely sort of, the, the, it's not the stereotype you know, that I was raised with, and, and I'm really thankful for that. Thank you. Others? It's funny that you say that. Oh, did you want to? No, I was just going to say, it's funny that you say that because um, my brother, growing up, was huge. You know, he was kind of the tech person in our family. And that started with kind of like stereos and, you know, putting together all the components. And so when I got a stereo, I knew that I wasn't just going to get like a jam box, which, yes, there were jam boxes when I was younger. Um, but, it, you know, I had to have all the different components. And um, even on computers, he would do computer programming, and I would try to learn some computer programming. And um, I sent him a message recently because he's trying to start up a business. And I'm like, oh, have you done this? Have you, have you checked your analytics? Do you have that set up on your site? And he's like, you lost me at analytics. I have no idea what you're talking about. And I was like, score, I'm the tech in our family now. So that was a huge moment for me. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you talked about your mother. It hadn't occurred to me until you said that. My mother was an early adopter. She had a small business. And so she, you know, in the very early 80s was technology 
commission before me and saying, you know, Carrie, you need to do this, you need to be like pushing me, and I'm like, Mom, leave me alone. <laughs> and, um, so it was kind of interesting, but I actually came to technology, not because of the technology, but um, I was reminded the other day of the first moment when I sort of woke up to the, the power of technology. Um, it was when my, my father passed, and a few years after, or for a few weeks after he passed away, um, I received a, a newsletter from the hospital where he died. And so it was the, the data wake up call where I was like, wow, y'all should have known that. Um, you shouldn't be sending me this newsletter because that's just wrong. And um, from there I became super interested in the data piece of it. I'm really intrigued by the power of data. Somebody mentioned, mentioned the Super Crunchers book, which is, you know, it's my Bible and carry it around with me. Um, and so it's it's really the, the data, the relationship of, of the relationship of us as packets of data and mapping and matching and, and the power of that. And I think in higher ed, um, we struggle in, in, with, in general with technology, but um, and I think our students are becoming less um, patient with us uh, because they're like, you should know. Um, so it's that you should know piece. And I think and they're right. Back <laughs> to the data. And so the, the tools change and they're gonna change and they're gonna develop, but it's really the human piece in relationship to it all that I find super interesting and um, you know, can be told more and try to harness that and use it for good and not evil. I think it's great. Thank you for sharing. Before we go to our next piece, anybody else have to yeah. right. You know, whether or not you consider yourself in technology, um, you're here at a student affairs tech conference. Um, so you've got some level of engagement with the content at some point for some use on your campus. And of course, we'd like you now to take um, a role in a group activity. <laughs> you got it. Even you in the back, Mr. Jackson. We um, promise it's pretty painless. It'll though. be painless. So um, three. It was painless for us. We started doing this. We should share our, our <laughs> stuff too. Because we, when we got on the first conference call to do this presentation, the first thing I think, or you know, maybe the second thing we started talking about was like, you know there was this one time and so that was kind of what we wanted to get from you all like have there been times where um, you've been a woman in the room or you know a woman in the room who got um, just kind of completely you know omitted from the conversation or have run into obstacles and so like a couple of ours like I was at a um, board meeting actually um, for uh, our advisory board and brought up what I thought was a pretty cool idea. It was this whole, like, instead of newsletter, use the word press site. We've been, Eric and I have talked back and forth about that a little bit. Um, but I really wanted to do that for our region. And so people were like, oh yeah, that's cool. Well, the next day, um, one of the men on the board brought like these, you know, very, like he basically took the idea that I came up with and started creating all these visuals for it and everything, like brought pictures. and people just got really enthusiastic and I found myself getting so upset. I was like, man, what, why am I getting so upset? It's great that this, you know, younger, new professional is coming up with this idea. And I'm like, he didn't come up with the idea. I came up with the idea. And so I was really frustrated because I'm like, you know, at that point it was like, well, what, why is he getting all the praise when, when I came up with this idea and talking to a few of my colleagues around the table, you know, I was like, that really upset me that, there's this male, and as soon as he said the same thing that I did, you suddenly were praising that idea, and it was kind of okay when I presented it. And so I was able to confront it, but it was really frustrating. You don't always have the chance to confront it. Yeah, on that kind this of level. is true. Some of it's systemic, some of it's campus leadership, some of it's things that you're not comfortable to challenge um, in group settings. But you know, everyone has a different perspective on the, the status of women in technology. So what we're gonna ask you all to do is to get into, let's see, two groups, one group of four, one group of three. And we want you to come up with your own statement of what you believe is the status of women in technology. And we'd like your statement to be 140 characters, and we'd like it to be tweeted <laughs> on our session hashtag. Get well, on. so it can't actually be 140 characters. <laughs> yeah, sorry, less than 140 characters. And also, <coughs> think about what obstacles Again, I want to go back to that obstacle piece. What obstacles have you faced? Because we're going to come back and talk about the obstacle piece a little bit later, too. So, okay. ready? Top 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. All right, folks, let's pull it back together.
we acknowledge that um, the task of coming up with a short statement to describe an entire group of people is um, <laughs> some, somewhat strange uh, for what we are and who we are and what we do for our professions. Uh, but we're also curious to hear uh, what the prevalent themes were uh, from your conversation. Uh, so who wants to share some about some of your discussion? Ours ended up becoming more about um, the role of women in the in the world as a whole and the concepts of privilege that really ended up centering around technology at all. Okay. So, that's, a, that's actually what was running through my mind when Kristen was sharing um, her piece before about the ideas um, being discounted. Mm -hmm. You know, and when we talk about women in technology, it's really important to think of: you know, are we talking about technology specifically, or are we talking about women as a whole? and the workplace dynamics and uh, some of these things that all professions are dealing with. Um, so thank you for bringing that forward. Uh, were there other um, themes that came up in your group that maybe didn't make it into the final statement? Mm -hmm. David? Okay. Um, How about you all? More with the uh, women in technology accent because it's for now. Uh, and it's okay. uh, basically There's a fun dynamic between the choices women make for professions and some of the STEM related pieces and also what I mentioned before about women who choose to be technology focused in other positions. Um, do you think that both of those groups of women face similar challenges? Do you think it's different? You know, one thing that popped into my head was that you know the career choice starts very young and, and inclination um, starts very young. So even if you um, heard messages that you're going to grow up and be a teacher and that's the only option available to you. Um, you know, do you choose to be a science teacher is one question. But even if you end up as a teacher in an education profession, um, are you still supported in the idea that you want to focus on technology and use technology um, in that profession as well? Um, some interesting themes at play. Um, do you want to share what you mentioned about the cinematography? Yeah, did you guys was just talking about it a little bit that um, most cinematography students are, are men and so most Films are that we see are, are seen through the lens of the man with the choices, everything that's made. But and we're talking about my, one of my favorite students was an Asian female student. I was just like championing her. And I think we have a role and a responsibility to to champion these students who do choose to, you know, rock a paradigm and uh, rock a population where they're not necessarily wanted and where it's not easy for them. Um, and I think if you look at the your own college or university and the, the pockets where they are male heavy, um, it's not an easy road for these young women. And, uh, and I don't think we talk about that. So, you know, we talk about underserved populations or but we don't talk about the three women in cinematography out of several hundred, or we don't talk about the two women in the, you know, engineering program. I just may face equal challenges, I think. Anything we want to add? I, I actually just kept me back off the internet, so I'm a little distracted. I'm sorry. I had to tweet out something that you guys wrote, and then I was kicking you. One thing that um, I did want to address, and I, I think Jeff brought it up, but also um, it's been up kind of on Twitter today. Um, some comments about the session this morning. Did you all have any thoughts about the session this morning, the opening keynote? Anybody follow any of the tweet conversation about that? Yeah. <laughs> Eric started it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was all men up on the stage. And I think the majority of our speakers here um, at this conference are men. And um, I was on um, the programming committee, although I didn't get to decide the speakers, obviously. Um, but I did bring this up, actually, early on in the conversations, that there seemed to be a dearth of women uh, mentioned as our keynote speakers. And we got a Women in Tech Mini Institute for 
um, my efforts, which is important in itself. Um, but I think it also kind of pushes us off to the side. Um, and so I think these are important issues that we need to talk about, that we can promote ourselves, but we also need those people who are in key positions to provide that promotion as well and to recognize and to support. And so um, it can't just be women get out there and talk, you know, talk about yourselves. Because I even said, look, we've got this whole Student Affairs Women Talk Tech blog. Any one of them could come and be a speaker. Any one of them, because that is what that's what we do. We write about technology. We all have presented somewhere about technology, and any one of these could come be a keynote speaker. Um, now, are any one of us, you know, big names? I don't know about that. Probably not. But you know, it's still important. Do we know what we're talking about? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, I think it's important that we continue to promote that, and that um, those people who are in key positions need to promote that as well. And we need to recognize because we're out there. Um, but there's only so far we can get by ourselves. I think a lot of times too, kind of piggyback on what you're saying, you might not consider yourself a tech person. And I remember the first time they started the ACOI community of practice like with tech technology and I thought, well this could be really interesting and I had an interest in it. Um, but then, I, then they started having, okay, at the ACUI conference, for people who um, might know about social media, do you want to help folks who are at the conference kind of get their accounts started? I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do that. And the next thing you know, they're like, oh, well, do you want to do a presentation on something, you know, for the tech community of practice? I'm like, oh, I don't necessarily know if I know anything. Like, well, what kind of things are you thinking about? And they said, well, do you know about any kind of productivity apps or programs? I was like, oh, well, you know, yeah, I mean, I kind of know about like Evernote and OneNote and kind of combining them. And they're like, what? And I was like, well, you know, you can take Evernote and OneNote. And they're like, yeah, that. <laughs> so next thing you know, I'm presenting about that. And I'm kind of like, who am I to be talking about Evernote? You know, but I am somebody to talk about it because I do know it. And there are other people who don't know how to do this stuff. And you know, it's it is important to find those other women who, who do know these things too. So one of the things, that, especially if people are listening to this, you know, out there and in the back channel and stuff, though, um, you know, think about what your interests are and what you know. You may find that you actually do have a lot of tech knowledge, and you are actually kind of one of those tech people. And I'm going to call Cindy out really quick. You say you're not a woman in tech. How many presentations are you doing at this conference? Mm -hmm. Three. Mm -hmm. Three different presentations at a tech conference, <laughs> and she's not a woman in tech. So I just want to point that out really yeah. quick. So Eric, oh, you had something you were going to share. Yeah, and so you know, the featured speakers list, uh -huh. uh, there's a single woman on the, the featured speaker list at this event, and... There's, well, one's a moderator, yeah. Right. Okay. And then Terry's on the... Yeah. Ex exactly. So I think that you know, part of it is all of us self-selected to come into this session. Right, and, and so the numbers, unfortunately, for those of you, you know, who watch the live stream, you can't see the numbers, but they're very low. We're holding them back at the door. And, and I think that you know, <laughs> you know, one of the things right. that, you know, like you said, is that you, know, you, you say, hey, what's going on with this? Why is the representation so skewed? And, and then you, there's an institute, which, like you said, it kind of puts people off to, you know, off to the side versus having a featured talk when it's the entire group of folks who are literally captive and has the folks in the room who really do need to hear the message because a lot of folks who are in this room, we are we already drank Kool-Aid, right? Mm -hmm. We we're already saying, hey, heck yeah, you know, down with patriarchy, et cetera, versus the folks who aren't in this room. You know, social justice is such a major component to what we talk about and do and read and, and hopefully live. But talk is cheap, folks. You know, butts in the seats count a lot more. And I think that you know, at next year's event, there is one having a panel of women talk tech to the entire round table, large room is, is important. It's important that they're not just talking about the state of women in technology, you know, that those women could be talking about, you know, integrating Blackboard on exactly, the campus. Exactly, exactly, because I don't have to talk, I mean, when I go up there and talk, I don't say, this is the state of men in technology, right. I just right. need to talk about tech. Right, right. And that's very huge. Absolutely. Well, so we've spent a lot of time talking about our current state, right? We've talked about where we are. And I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little frustrated right now. So about frustrated about, yeah, grr, thank you. <laughs> so I'm feeling a little frustrated about this. So we didn't want you to leave. One of my biggest pet peeves is when you go to a presentation and they sit there and they tell you the problem and then they're done, right? It sucks because you leave and you're like, okay, what am I supposed to do? But I already knew the problem existed. We wanted to spend some time also talking about 
what can we do to change this? How can we move forward from here? Um, and Eric's right, the people who are in this room, small but mighty, right? Because you're already passionate about this, you're already interested in this. And so we are going to call on you to be advocates and to um, send the message out to those people who aren't here today and those people who are watching or who are following along um, on our uh, hashtag. It's really important that, that you do some of these things that we're going to talk about. So um, do you want to, I think yeah. you start with this. So. Yeah, uh, I don't know about you, but higher ed, we're not necessarily known for our quick rate of change, right? You know, the, the change process is slow for us sometimes maybe or is that just my campus no just my campus okay <laughs> well then <laughs> here we go uh, we want to talk about a change model and uh, this is by um, John Cotter k-o-t-t-e-r and I don't know if you are familiar with his um, eight steps to institute change uh, this was a book that I read for a leadership related activity and when I read it and when I got to understand his change model, so much became clear to me about things that I've done wrong in my past of trying to advance change. No matter what the issue, no matter how big or how small, he talks about a change process that needs to build on each other in order to move something forward. So what we want to do for the next uh, piece of time that we're together is to talk about change relating to women in technology going on a few different levels of the state of the profession. Uh, your campus culture, as well as ways we work together and deal with each other um, departmentally, on the committee level, um, and in day-to-day -day work. Um, so I'm going to take the first couple stages of the change model, and then each of us is going to take a piece of this to try to talk about what we're going to do and how we're going to move things forward. Um, so the first step along this change circle here is uh, called establish a sense of urgency. So my question about your campus, or even the profession, have we established a sense of urgency about women in technology? What do you think? Is there a sense of urgency? No. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Sorry. Not at all. And this author will say that in, until we establish a sense of urgency, that the rest of this stuff doesn't matter. Makes sense, right? As far as campus stuff, you know, until problems happen, <laughs> then we really start paying attention. It's really sad. Uh, but things we could do to establish a sense of urgency are things like even having this institute. The fact that we're a small yet mighty group here together is one thing, but the fact that we're live streaming it today is fantastic because it will help to create a sense of urgency about women in technology. There are things you can do to turn up the volume um, and to do it in a professional and polished kind of way, in a collegial kind of way, that points out things that we can do um, to start this process rolling. What are things we can do uh, to establish urgency around women in technology? Action steps. We can blog about it, thank you. That's one thing we can do. That was that person out in the hallway. Yes, thank you. Uh, we can blog about it. You know, Writing about this presentation is the first thing we're gonna do. Um, so that's one example of, again, creating a sense of urgency. We wanna take that from one blog post and amplify it. We all have some tools that can do that. Maybe you've heard of this thing called Twitter. Um, so you know, when you see Kristen posting this link from the Women Talk Tech uh, blog, amplifying that um, through your followers as well. You know, joining in on the establishing a sense of urgency. Jenna, did you have something? Oh, I was going to say we have a voice, and we've been talking about the lack of women speakers. We have a voice through the evaluation process, yeah, so we great. make sure that great. they all know that we have noticed and that Thank we're you. concerned about it. Excellent. And we talked a little bit as we were working on this presentation about, you know, it's not enough just to say this wasn't good or there's a problem. You know, there's, there's more pieces of this change model where we have to be part of a solution as well. So things like not just saying there needs to be more women speakers. Instead, it's there needs to be more women speakers. And here are 27 people I know that could probably do a great job um, are the things like that we need to be involved with. Anything else that you can think of with establishing a sense of urgency? So much. I like it. I, I think so. I feel like this mirrors how I've sort of personally tried to establish a sense of urgency when it comes to student affairs and technology. Yes, it does. And that means being very loud mm -hmm. and in people's faces constantly. And that means I have a ton of haters. <laughs> but for all the haters out there, there's also a lot of folks who are totally digging it. And so it's about uh, going out there and megaphoning it and producing tons of media, like I said, blog posts, tweets, Facebook, mm -hmm. 
videos. I mean, we got to have more shows. You know, we got to have all sorts of stuff. And I think that it, it, every single time we have the, the platform, we have to go out there and, and fight the good fight. Yeah, it's so true. What I, it's funny because I have some notes on this, and I think my note was speak out and speak loud. And depending on the day, I'm either the world's biggest feminazi or I'm a great champion for women's rights. So, but it's true because you're going to piss off some people because they're going to get tired of hearing your voice. That's why it also needs to be more than one voice because my it's too easy for people to say that's just Kristen. It needs to be multiple voices, and so you need to be telling the people around you. I was going to say we definitely need partners in crime. Yeah. You know, you need to find those people who can help help make that happen. So you sit around grumbling about it. Who are these people? Definitely. Definitely. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm also running through other changes that I've tried to establish on campus. You know, Eric used that example about tech and student affairs. You know, I, I don't care if you feel like you need, a, you know, two garbage cans instead of one at your dining services event. Um, you know, no matter what the issue, you know, this issue of establishing urgency and creating urgency for what you want to try to do. Um, it has to do with speaking up, speaking loud, like we said, also informing people of the urgency of inaction. Um, the tech and student affairs example, if we don't start teaching technology to new uh, grad students and new professionals in our field, when they become senior student affairs officers, you know, they're not going to have the competencies that they're going to need um, to create the kind of leadership that our field needs. So it's the what if scenario as well. So if we don't put more women um, in front of technology presentations. You know, we're not, we're gonna have these quit rate problems that we talked about earlier. Um, we're gonna have women that have interest in these areas that are not gonna find a place um, in our associations and in our field, and that's a serious consequence. Um, Jenny, you look like you had something to say. Mm -hmm. I made that up. Okay, yes. One other thought you know, is aligning with, with other groups, you know, within marginalized populations. I think we oftentimes, we, and I say this as, you know, the tall, white middle class educated guy, right? Straight. So clearly this ignore those identities that I have at the moment. But you know, marginalized populations when aligned and, and when you know, sort of bonded together are much more powerful than, you know, communities that are subordinated. You know, folks come together and do a lot more. So it's you know it's it's women talk tech. It's it's people of color talk tech. It's people of color who are women talk tech. It's you know, LGBT women of color with disabilities, content, right? <laughs> and it's, it's everybody who has historically, traditionally had to work a hell of a lot harder than folks who look, talk, and act just like me. Thank you. Right. Anything else on sense of urgency before we move to the next one? Uh, finding champions, also. Champions? So yeah. you're not just doing it alone. Oh, we're getting good segue. <laughs> people that have clouds. I'll look at your Google Docs. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, not, Jeff. He's not, he's next not. next step in this model talks about creating a guiding coalition. And this is now the group of people that can guide this effort and can help be your core group for advancing change. You didn't know we were going to actually leave, make you leave with a job, right? <laughs> <laughs> By coming to this session, you become part of a guiding coalition, or a potential guiding coalition, at least. Um, you know, on your campus, when you're thinking of advancing change, you know, who are the people that could be part of this coalition for you? If we're talking about a campus level and how the state is on your campus for women in technology, who are the people that might be your champions? And who are the people that might be able to have a dialogue about women in technology on your campus? Even just the three of us working together, you know, has been a productive experience where we know that we have a shared commitment to advancing a goal. When you're talking about creating a guiding coalition, um, some things that I've done on my own campus have to do with open calls for um, invitations to a brainstorming meeting. And trying to make it, you know, let's just get together and talk about ideas. No commitments, no projects, no committees you have to join yet. Um, that guiding coalition development has to do with building formal connections. You know, ultimately somebody's got to say yes to some things and get some things going. But it's also saying yes to just being a part of the discussion and the dialogue. Both of these pieces are important. And when you're trying to create this guided coalition, finding where you can look in even the most unique places uh, for people that uh, will support your whatever venture you're taking on. For example, uh, you know, going to Eric and saying, you know, being a part of a guided coalition to advance women in technology. You know, because of those identities, he just li lifts it off for us. You know, would he be the first person you would think of? Now he's going to be, because he's here in this session. 
and because he's able to come to a session and speak up and speak out and speak loud about what's right and what's just. When you think about a guiding coalition for something like this in the, in the state of our profession, who comes to mind? What forums come to mind about how to develop a guiding coalition for women in tech? More sessions like this. Yes, thank you. A person in the hallway. Great idea. Yes. For higher ed? Or uh, for, for higher ed, student affairs, yes. both. Yeah. Uh, for higher ed, I mean, having sessions at a tech conference would be nice. Good. Um, that's a good start. But I mean, I think the associations have huge clouds. I mean, more so than probably an individual person on the campus. Yep. Okay. But on a campus level, you know, the, you get the vice presidents and deans, those to care, um, to do it. But you can get the associations to take it across. Them. So let's talk about how the association commitment is operationalized. So what does that look like? Associations are going to become part of a guiding coalition. How do we walk the walk and talk the talk? Association to start working your way up the uh, right. placement ladder so that now that you get that level, you can actually go. Sure, sure. And associations looking at who you're tapping for volunteer opportunities is a big one. Um, not making assumptions related to technology um, that are very focused on one gender. Um, putting open calls for who's interested in this kind of a project uh, will help make sure that people emerge. Uh, but also the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, if you know Kristen um, is very interested in this area, you know, placing a personal phone call and saying, I'd really like you to do this uh, will really go a long way. I think the other thing that we have to, to do, um, well, even that women have to do, is be willing to say, Put me, put me on the short list. And I think that that's hard. And I'll, I'll cop to that for myself. On a conference call with other people on the programming committee, when I brought up women in technology and they asked for speakers, I didn't mention my name, but I did mention, I did mention our blog. But, you know, I kind of was like, I didn't mention my name, but then I contacted the um, person from NASPA who I'd worked with later and said, I can. I can do this. Like I can get up there and talk about this. This is something that I'm very familiar with that I've done presentations on, you know. And again, got this institute um, to to talk about it. Um, but I think it is being able to say on that conference call, well, yeah, duh, me. You know, you thought of me first when you wanted to do this programming committee. Why didn't you think of me as a speaker? I, I don't want to get too far off the topic, but that reminds me of the the show Sandberg uh, TED Talk. Um, she was talking about women in film leadership or lack of women in leadership roles. And one of the things she says is that a lot of women take themselves out of the game because they don't have that um, sometimes falsified bravado that, that men would have. They think they're awesome when they're not kind of yeah, thing. Right. Um, and the women are almost the other side. They, they know they can do it, but they're almost they may be afraid to volunteer for it. Well, and let's also acknowledge, too, the the cultural expectation that's kind of, well, and I won't say cultural expectation, well, it kind of is. I think right now it's, we need to be promoting each other, we need to be promoting each other, and we absolutely do, but that doesn't mean you do it at the sake of not getting yourself out there too. Right. And I think that's where we get to, like when you do promote yourself as a woman, it sometimes is considered stepping on other women to do it, and that's not, There's those are two different things. Yes, you can do that, but if you do get yourself in a role, where you can be powerful, then you can help lift up other women. But if all you're always doing is saying, go girl, you know, you can do it, get up there, but you don't have any power behind that, that doesn't help anybody, other than giving them good cheer and good thoughts. Times. <laughs> yeah. So we talked a lot about like coming from, from the top, but we're kind of more like in the middle. Yep. So a lot of people also have like a middle, like a middle or down approach, like, like totally. the woman at the have this interest start to pull in the the younger crowd and sure. their like trainings and blogs and start to listen. Awesome. Excellent. And sometimes it's a matter of just not knowing the structures or the vehicles for that those points of entry. I know when I first got into student affairs, you know, knowing how to get involved in any kind of project is confusing because every association does it differently and there's people that change over and you're right, you know, those of us who know the structure. Um, you know, that can find newer professionals and bring them on and bring them in um, and asking them to join us for presentations and writing blog posts is an excellent idea. Uh, when you're thinking about this concept of guiding coalition, uh, just one more piece of campus examples. 
when you're trying to advance the climate on your own campus, uh, thinking about who in general is out there advocating for women on your campus. They may not be focused on women in tech, but they might be focused on other social justice related pieces that have to do with advancing the quality of life for women on your campus. Um, you have a conversation with those folks. Sit down for coffee and say, you know, have we ever talked about technology specifically? And see what they have to say. Um, these could be faculty members, these could be administrators in different areas, um, these could be untapped people um, that we haven't been able to work with in the past. Um, so that guiding coalition, uh, whether you're talking about the departmental level, the campus level, or through the profession, um, it's a key piece of change. You can see again how the circle can't move forward um, without that guiding coalition. Um, the third piece, developing a clear shared vision. Um, anybody who's ever gone to any leadership training before knows the crucial aspects of developing shared vision. Um, clear shared vision means that your guiding coalition shared uh, that we're all talking about what would it look like um, in the future if we were able to advance women in technology. You know, again, how is that operationalized? What does that look like on a daily basis? When we come to a conference and we're at the you know, next tech conference five years from now, uh, what's, what's going to be different about that conference than this one? Um, so working with your guiding coalition for everyone to get invested on defining that shared vision and seeing what, might, what it might be ahead. Um, again, without a vision ahead, we can't define the next steps, right? Um, so the next piece is um, going into communicating the vision. Um, so communicating the vision, we've kind of t started talking about this already, and that this was one of the reasons we wanted you to be thinking about that 140 character statement. How are you going to communicate this out? And it's really important, you know, again, that speak out, speak loud comes into to play here as well. Um, in addition, we need to have a shared vision of what this is. If we're all going out with different ideas of what it is, it doesn't become a vision anymore. It just kind of becomes individual thoughts. And so what is our shared vision um, for what we're, what we're trying to promote here, for what we're going to do moving forward? And that takes place at this level, at this kind of vague, you know, large student affairs level but also at the campus level and at the department level. If you make sure that you promote within your department that it is important to me that incoming employees have um, a tech uh, background or that they have um, the, the ability to train with me, that, I, that is going to be an important thing for our department, <coughs> and you'll start to see that take place for all of those people if you keep voicing that. Same thing, it's important to me to foster this, those women who do have um, technological um, skills, interests, whatever, it's important for me to promote that and you continue to voice that and you really make sure that people share that, it's going to get known and pe other people are going to do that work too for you. So you see you have to communicate, it can't just be about um, creating the vision, you have to make sure people know what your vision is. Um, step five, um, removing obstacles. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about here, I'm sorry I'm moving all over the, the room for Eric, but um, one of the things that we talked about were some of those obstacles that we faced um, as women or that we see on our campus, um, that we see other women face. And so I do want to take a few minutes here to talk about uh, those obstacles that we discussed. So the cinematography, I believe, was one. Um, seeing the, the women on the stage to this morning or at any other time, um, those pieces. So what are your thoughts after we've talked about some of those pieces that have, are barriers for women succeeding in technology? Do you have thoughts for what that might look like to remove those? I have one um, talking about social acceptance of women with tech focus mm -hmm. and you know how those folks might be treated in social settings and social circles. Is it cool to be a tech person um, for women as well as for men? heard about cool this morning. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but we, we need to work on making it cool. Absolutely. I, I think for me as a guy, it's, it's about, you know, it's affirming women who are tech leaders, right? And it's affirming that it's cool to be this, the, the student affairs techie, nerd, geek, whatever. But also at the same time, it's about saying to, to the fellas who are right next to me, hey, what you just did isn't okay, or what you just said is not, isn't, isn't acceptable. I mean, one of the, the bloggers on Inside Higher Ed, last year wrote a post and, and his title was something like this is so easy my mom could do it i remember and that said, wait a minute <laughs> my, pretty my smart. mom is smarter than everyone when it comes to technology and you're also reinforcing the idea that moms aka women are not good at technology and re reifying the idea that men by default are and so perpetuating these norms mm -hmm. which are totally not normal at all and so i think for guys it's about being aware enough and being 
brave enough to, to sort of fight those social norms um, and not just say, oh, hey, that's just, you know, that's cool to do, that's cool to say, so really stick it up for, for folks and call people out because, you know, we don't, we don't do that enough. I don't think guys don't, guys don't call each other out enough. And all three of us, we are moms, so there. That's right. <laughs> Did you have something? When, I, I, when we were talking, I was just curious about something. You were t telling the story about when this man sort of uh -huh. adopted your idea. And um, did you act on an impulse to call him out publicly? I did not. What curious. I did was I, I went and talked to my colleagues around the table that I felt comfortable talking uh -huh. to afterwards and said, you know, that, that was actually really hurtful personally but also professionally and, and this is why and explain it to them and, and made sure that they got it because I I think you have to you toe a fine line there because he, he was also a younger new professional and I didn't want to slam him down too you know so it was kind of a, a two two things that I was trying to play there um, so yeah that was what I did instead which seemed to which at least for those colleagues around the table who are fairly high placed at their institutions, it's going to make them think twice the next time they do that. And that's what I consider to be important. Right. Does that so, make sense? You, so you acted on the way that yeah. you felt would actually affect change. Right. Yeah, as opposed to, to coming off as maybe a little bit, and I also wanted to make sure that my knee jerk response to it wasn't just, it, it didn't come out as just being frustrating and lashing out. So I really wanted to make sure that I gave a really calm, logical response to it, which and I think is important. In your opinion, if it, um, with the, the male peers that you have, uh -huh. would they have responded the same way or would they have called it out in the moment? What do you think? I'm just curious. I really don't. I have, a, I have a, actually a, a mix of male peers, and I do think you're right. There's some that would have called it out. But I think there's a lot of them that would have probably just later on said something as well. So I think it just depends. And, and again, we're in a field that's not necessarily, uh, it is, there's a lot of women at the at the level that I'm at. And um, and so I think that it there are some different gender norms there sure. that, that um, play a role in that. So I, I think in a corporate culture, it might've been different too, so. Yeah, sure. One of the things that I that I do want to address, like as a as a barrier, and Cindy kind of started talking about this, but that's stepping outside those stereotypes, and that's kind of what you were talking about too, and being willing to promote yourself, being willing to step up and, and do those things, and being willing to uh, to say, look, I'm I'm a geek, and that's cool, and I always talk about geek chic and those sorts of things, and um, I really, you know. I kind of embrace that. Uh, no, I don't kind of. I do embrace that, and I really talk about um, all the different gadgets, and I'll totally go off on tangents in a meeting. I had a parent in an orientation recently ask me Mac or PC, and I was like, well, you know, like, okay, maybe I need to tone that down, because they all started getting big eyes, and I'm like, uh, okay, you know, so I'm like, that's kind of my area of interest. But you do have to step outside. You have to be willing to speak up and say, no, you know, hey, that's me. I'm the tech person. I do know what I'm talking about. And I think, you know, Jennifer's example of say, speaking up for herself is an excellent um, demonstration of that. Um, I also think it's stepping outside that um, for a lot of us who are tech, one of the reasons we like technology is because it's a way for us to interact with the world behind a computer. I mean, it's an introverted thing, you know. For me, I, I know I'm up here talking right now. But um, I will probably, after this conference is over, go like hide out for a couple of days because I'm an introvert. And, and so it sometimes is hard for me to get out there and get my voice heard and make sure that they're hearing me. Um, I think it's really interesting. The um, chief information officer on my campus is a female. And she is, I love her because she's blunt, she's to the point, she doesn't mince words. And I absolutely love talking to her because that's totally how I talk. She doesn't get offended when I say stuff. Um, and I have male colleagues that get offended, you know, when I say stuff because I'm blunt I'm to the point and I step outside of those stereotypes. Um, and so it, it is interesting that, um, that I get called aggressive, you know, when I see it as being assertive. And so it's those pieces. But you kind of have to, and, and they talked about this a little bit this morning, Dean Elmer talked about it. Grow, grow, grow a thick skin because you are going to get criticized if you step outside those stereotypes. You are going to get told that you're not as feminine as other people. Um, I'm okay with that. I, you know, I don't know what femininity is exactly that you know I'm not as because I'm still a woman. 
but I'm okay stepping outside of that if it means I get to do the things that I enjoy doing and that I'm good at doing. So I think that's important to, to talk about, um, stepping outside those stereotypes. The next step here, the next step here is to create short-term wins. Um, and we've actually, we talked about a few of these, and as I was on the plane ride um, here yesterday, I started like brainstorming, like, oh, how cool would it be? They have a women um, senior student affairs officer conference, right? And I'm like, how cool would it be if we had a whole institute around women who are interested in technology? And then I was like, well, but then you have to go off this way. You have to, like, what is technology and all that sort of stuff? But it really was, the idea was, you know, okay, how do we promote these women? How do we get out there? And so that's probably more of a long-term win. I still think that's something that could be beneficial. Um, but some of the things that we can do, how about blogging? How about creating more blogs by women about technology? Um, what was it probably like half a year ago that, that Ed Cabellan did that post on and he was posting like different blogs on technology and he finished posting it and there was not a single blog on there by women and I don't think that was Ed's fault necessarily they're hard to find um, I, I blog about technology and student affairs I mean he was trying to look for that that combination of student affairs and technology um, and um, a colleague of mine, Brenda Bethman, pointed that out to him. She's like, hey, Kristen's got this great blog on technology. Why aren't you posting about her? And he, of course, immediately amended his post to include it. But the idea was that we, we were having a hard time finding it. And so that's when we created the Student Affairs Women Talk Tech blog. And that's part of that, you know, trying to get other people who are maybe not as confident about posting a blog on their own, you know, that they want to, but they want to post. And, and I think that any of our bloggers could easily do a blog all by themselves on technology, women in technology. They may not have the time to do that, and we understand that. So, and that's kind of that forum of student affairs, women talk tech that allows, you know, people to come in. And that's where I hope we also get um, some, you know, younger professionals who are trying to just kind of get out there um, and get them to blog for that as well. But we also need to have some standalone women bloggers about technology. And I say blogs because the, that's what's getting a lot of feed right now. I mean, that's what's, that you're getting a lot of um, press almost, I guess. You know, you're, you're getting out there. You're getting tweeted. You're getting, people are reading you. You're, they're making sure that's the name that's coming to their mind. Um, and so we do need that. We need the, the blogs out there. We need um, women tweeting. We need them writing, publishing, you know, writing articles about this everywhere. Um, and those, those are some small things, really. I mean, some people are looking at me like, publishing, that's not that small. It, it can be. I write for our um, regional newsletter, which is publishing. It's on a smaller scale, but it's publishing. I write for that, you know, about once every two or three months. You know, how do you get out there and do that? But we need to be posting and writing and getting out there. We need to be doing shows. Jeff Jackson <laughs> tweeted about us doing, we need to be doing a podcast. So yeah, we may look into that. that. You know, but we need to get out there. And those are things that, you know, you could do in a short amount of time that would show a much, you know, larger group of us out there, a lar much larger group of women. Um, so those are some small things that you can do that are short-term wins. What do, you, what do you all think? What are some short-term wins? What would, what would it take for you to think, yeah, that we definitely have made a difference? Do you have an idea? No? You looked really excited, so I was like, <laughs> yeah, she has an idea. <laughs> Sorry. No. Yeah. yeah. Not really a blogger, um, uh -huh. but I would like to see some infographics. See? Uh, yeah. You should do that for, for the um, Women Talk Tech blog, too. We have somebody on there who really, like, Jess Falk, who loves to do infographics. And so um, about every other post she does is an infographic. Um, and they're great. They're really fun. And they get, those tend to get a lot of um, circulation. So that's another great way to... Visual learners to, like myself. Yeah, that's a great way to, to get yourself out there. Other thoughts? Anyone? Bueller? Anybody catching that reference? I, d I can't do that with my, uh, yeah. I can't do it with my students anymore. That's so sad. Um, well, I think there are some, some short-term wins there that you can do just by promoting yourself, promoting others. Um, one thing I am going to call attention to, and that's kind of that empowering people to act on the vision as well as the 
well, it kind of goes into all of this. We have this, there's a hashtag out there right now, WL Assault. Have you all seen that? Um, it's basically, an, it's a way to empower women to, on Twitter, basically it's, um, what is it? It started at, at um, yeah, I'm trying to think, think of what SALT stands like for. And, yes, I, I'm like, I, I know you know what it is. It started at one of the, um, leadership. Women, yeah, it's women's leadership. Sustain, Su affirm, lift, transform. Support or sustain? Oh, we're showing our ignorance. So, anyway, oh, somebody's gonna tweet it. I know it. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good. Live, tweet it out. Yeah. Um, where's Terry Bump? I know. Where's Terry? Yeah. And it's, this has been a great support network. We need to identify, though, too. We need to support women specifically around technology. And so we need to to be clear. You know, I, it's it's so awesome. So I I don't want to. This is WL Salt is kind of an entity of its own and a community of its own. But we need to be very specific when we're talking technology that we're promoting women for reasons of technology. And so that almost needs its own hashtag, you know, to really, if you're going to create a community or support around that, Here we go. Support, you really, affirm, lift, and transform. there we go, support, affirm, lift, and transform. Um, and so you, you, you want to be able to say like, you know, not only that I'm, am I supporting this person because they're a woman, but because they're smart, because they are, they've got that this tech stuff down, you know, they get this. And so we need to be um, discerning when we support women in technology because you want to make sure that when we do make a showing, it is a showing. And so that I think is important too. Again, totally kind of a different thing. I was just want to make sure that we're, I, I love the WL salt, so I'm not knocking the WL salt. I hope we know that. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Um, you're up. Um, basically, step seven is build on a change. So you, you've gotten into the. Oh no, you're gonna get me on camera. All right, do I have to? All right, um, building on the change. Sometimes victory is declared too early, and I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere, but I'm not gonna go there. Um, but quick wins are the only a, a beginning. So we just talked about some of the quick wins. That's only a start. That's just to get some stuff out there right away. Um, but success provides an opportunity. To Opportunity to build on what went wrong and why and identify what you can improve so after every win analyze what went wrong and I mean sorry what went right <laughs> what needs improving um, and just take a look at everything that you're doing and set goals to continue building on the momentum that we've created and I say we have created because I'm hoping that as a community we will and we will move forward from here from today see we're working on it as we're set we're having this session we're also building this community. So uh, keep ideas fresh by bringing in new change agents and leaders from your coalition. Don't forget those coalition people. So maybe you, you were working on something and you had a few folks who were your partners and then you kind of got through one step and then they kind of go away for a while. Bring them back in. Don't forget to always talk to those people that you have in, in your coalition. Um, and one of the things that we talked about uh, with the three of us as we were talking about step seven was promoting the grads, undergrads, and new professionals around you and, and trying to bring them into the coalition, but building on those change and continuing to make the coalition even stronger um, by bringing up those the next generation of folks. And let's skip right into step eight. Um, anchoring the changes in, in your our culture. To make any change stick, it should become a part of the core of your organization. So um, this reminds me of like Greek life when I was supposed to be talking to them about event planning and I spent actually the majority of the session talking about everything that you do is a reflection of yourself which I know is kind of Greek talk anyway but not being a Greek person I was kind of you know already getting into their the, the ideas that they have so um, but it's the same thing it's it's everything that you're gonna put out there about your community and the change you want to make you have to live that like we were saying earlier walk the walk talk the talk um, Ensure change is seen in every aspect of your organization. So it's important that your leaders continue to support the change, the new folks coming into your organization understand the change, um, telling the history of it. Well, you know what? Three years from now, we might always have a women in tech element of NASPA. Well, somebody's going to need to be there to say, you know, we didn't have that three years ago. Do you know the change that we've managed to make in three years? Somebody has to be that person. What you can do, talk about progress every chance you get. Um, tell success stories about your process and repeat stories that others have told. And 
Um, I can't wait to go back after this session. If you, if you missed my story at the beginning of the session, I was saying I, I almost didn't get a chance to come today. So I absolutely cannot wait to go back and be like, yeah, so my clout went up and this is how many uh, retweets I have. And this, I mean, and that sounds like, gosh, Jennifer, but no, that's what we're saying. Like you, sometimes you have to do that and you have to say, yeah, so the next time we're considering who the tech person is, I'm one of them, okay? And, and Jeremy's one and he can do stuff, but I can do stuff too. Um, include those ideals and values when you're hiring and training your new staff or bringing people into that new community, making sure that they understand everything. Publicly recognizing those people who are helping to bring about that change. Um, I was just thinking about um, somebody today mentioned Kristen and how she had done a lot for, and you weren't even there, but we were all like, yay, go Kristen, and tweeting that out and making sure everybody knew that, that she had, had a part in that. Um, and remembering contributions, I said that. Creating plans to replace the key leaders of change. So again, as folks move on, um, who are those other people that we want to bring into the community to help continue that change and, and keep the momentum going? So that's A3 in the chant. Where are you? Oh, where am I in here? You're trying to find it. around at the top. Yeah. Yeah, institutionalizing the change. I mean, the change model, I hope, brings true. It, for me, I always find it pretty easy to follow um, and also pretty easy to explain ways we can make mm -hmm. progress. Um, and I think uh, we just want to wrap up with some discussion of resources and ideas. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing is um, rather than handing out paper and all that sort of fun stuff, we are going to be posting um, resources that we've referred to and probably blogging a little bit about the session on the Student Affairs Women Talk Tech blog. So we'll see um, and this is the blog. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about this, uh, and here's Jennifer's post from the other day. <laughs> Geek TV. Um, <laughs> part two. Because <laughs> I started the trend. I have much more weighty. This, this was linkage love, so she's it's okay she's to have fun play. blogs. It's yes. cool. Exactly. Sort of. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's cool. <laughs> um, so this is a, a blog that um, another colleague, Brenda Bethman, I mentioned her earlier, she and I co-founded when we did see that there was kind of this dearth of, of women blogging. This is my word today. This is the third time I've used it. Um, this dearth of women blogging. Um, about technology and she knew that she wanted to blog but didn't have a whole lot of time and so I was like well there's got to be other people out there that want to blog but just don't have enough time and so we thought well let's just put together a, a group of women and see and we um, have now been going for over a year I'm pretty excited about that and we've, we've got a pretty solid group of bloggers right now but we're always looking for new and sometimes people want to transition off and you know at some point I'm sure some of these women Jennifer will want to start their own blog um, <laughs> Um, and, and we take guest posts as well, and so it's just kind of a chance for women to participate, um, but who maybe don't have enough time yet, um, and it does get some promotion for those, those women. And so if this is something that you're interested in or you know somebody who might be interested in, um, feel free to send their name uh, my way because I would be happy to look at them. Our, we usually do three-month uh, scheduling cycles, which uh, I am responsible for, and they're fun. Um, so I did, we are going to, Jennifer and I are going to post about this institute and talk a little bit about not only what we've been talking about, but what you have shared as well as some of your vision, some of the obstacles that you face, some of the discussion that we've had. Um, and we do post three times a week, pretty regularly three times a week. Uh, we'd love to increase that, but we also don't want to kill our bloggers um, knowing that we all have full-time jobs as something else um, elsewhere. So. Um, I did just want to share that. Um, other resources out there, again, I do want to mention the WL Assault hashtag because I do think that is a very supportive um, group and community that they're building there, and that is on Twitter if you are on Twitter. Um, there are lots of different groups. Uh, WISA, um, the WISA uh, NASPA community, Women in Student Affairs, has recently started a blog that is pretty spectacular, um, and although it's not tech specific, it, there are definitely, I think, there's potential to post on there about that, and it does definitely promote women. Um, so I do want to encourage looking at that. And of course, all three of us 
that are presenting today, I think, can be considered resources on this topic, as well as any of the women, really, who blog for, for the Student Affairs Women Talk Tech. Um, and so do consider those as, as resources, as your resources, or consider us, I should say, as, as your resources. Um, and if there's anything that we can do, we want to be able to, to promote. We did also want to offer a chance for people to ask questions or share final thoughts. I feel like it's SA chat, final thought of time. Um, but if, you, if anybody does have questions or thoughts, we did want to give you a chance to share that. People being quiet real quick. I know, the, 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 the blog, the Women Talk Tech blog, I don't know if you mentioned, we do different different days of the week have different themes. Yeah, we usually so. try to do a link theme post. And we, I mean, again, as we get more bloggers, this may change up too, um, blog. assuming blog. we get blog. 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 bloggers. Blog prompts. Blog prompts. Yeah, this is another thing that you can participate in. We always try to do these little prompts. And sometimes we get people that really like one and respond, mm -hmm. and sometimes we don't get anybody, and that's okay. We just put them out there in case. Um, I know that I, as a blogger, sometimes I'm like, what the heck am I going to blog about today? And just need a little bit of a prompt. Um, and so we put little questions out there um, about technology, about um, student affairs. Um, so it kind of gives you a chance to respond. Um, and we're always willing to promote those. Or you can respond in the comments, really. Um, that's another way you can participate, is responding in the comments. And then we have a blogger's choice um, that we do on Fridays. And that has ranged from everything about um, social justice issues and student affairs to uh, somebody recently actually did, Catherine Magara, who's one of our um, uh, bloggers, yeah, she did an excellent post on women, on the state of women in student affairs and technology. Um, so if you get a chance to go back and look at that, that's fantastic. I'm trying to think of what some of our other random ones have been too. They're all, I mean, Jess Falk has done several infographics for those. Uh, how is res life like Star Wars? That's, that's a particularly fun one to look at. So those are kind of all over the place. Um, so we do try to, you know, everybody gets kind of a chance to, to have their own voice come through on these. And I, something that is a wrap up, but something I, I know we didn't mention. I don't know if we want to go all the way back to the beginning and those kind of things, but um, we were talking about if you're retweeting or responding to a tweet. Oh yeah. To be respect, like if, if you're agreeing with someone, we were talking about sometimes if um, you're somebody's tweeting something and you totally agree with what they're saying, but you you direct message them versus um, just responding or retweeting responding. or just saying in public, hey, yeah, I totally agree. We were thinking that sometimes that also could help, you know, with if women say something intelligent, especially about tech, and others are trying to say, yeah, that's great. Um, as soon as you direct message that person back, there's no conversation. It just kind of, I mean, there is between you two, but there, it stops that conversation online. So we were saying always maybe be mindful of, of when you're responding to someone and if there's a Twitter conversation, maybe don't halt that conversation right away with a direct message and think, well, I don't know if people need to see what, it, really, really challenge yourself to start to keep that conversation going instead of shutting it down. So. Yeah. Do you have anything, final thoughts you want to say? This was fun. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, this was, we really enjoyed um, getting to present on the topic. And like I said, you know, um, there's, a, I think there are a couple things. There's a couple tweets out there. You know, why do we have to separate women from men in technology? Why do we have to separate um, women from men in student affairs? Well, ideally we don't, right? Ideally we don't because it should be about technology. It shouldn't be about gender and technology or race and technology or any of that. But we're not there yet. And until we are, I think there is a need to push um, women in technology and to make that a topic and keep it on the table um, until we start to see a little bit more leveling of the playing field. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, someday hopefully we'll be there. We'll be at a point where it's about technology and it's not about, you know, who in technology or, you know, what category fit into in technology. But we're not there yet. Um, but I think we've got some really positive things to take away from today and that, that there are some things that we can do and there are some things that you can do, hopefully. Um, and we are going to call on you to be our evangelists of sorts, to, to share um, what you heard today, to share some of that critical information. Make this topic urgent. Um, make it a priority on your campus, in your department, with your colleagues. Um, and hopefully we'll see this be a change for our
division, for our department, and for our profession. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Quick shout out to the Higher Ed Live Network. That's right, Student Affairs Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. Folks, Student Affairs Live would not be possible without the generous support of Integral. We're actually commercial free on Ustream because of them. We're actually the creators of the Schools app on Facebook. Be sure to check out their webinar series about how they can help you leverage Facebook to increase yield and retention.